profile picture on Instagram. Yep. Yeah. And no, you should see me that I'm live. And good evening, good evening, good morning, everyone who's watching. And welcome to another episode of the Medicine for the Soul series. And today I've got some really special guests for me that I'm really excited to talk about, which is Ali. So if you want to just request uh, to join the live. So we're doing it both on Facebook and on Instagram. And here she is. And welcome. Hello. Hi. I can't see you yet on Instagram. We're almost there. It's We're almost there. there. Okay. There you go. Okay. Does it? Does it? Oh. Oh. That might be due to the Facebook. What is that? Is that a fun noise? Is that? Okay. We'll just cancel it. I'll just turn off the Facebook Live. Okay. We'll just we'll just do Instagram. Okay. Facebook doesn't no want us. <laughs> All right. So let's just let's just keep Instagram. So yeah. Good morning. Good evening. Wherever you are, and welcome to another episode. And today we're going to talk about ego, and integrating the ego. And this is a topic that I've been exploring for the last decade at least and i've been like in all the extremes and i've done a lot of vipassana silent meditation retreats when i used to live in thailand and kind of studied buddhism and went into that kind of realm that believe that ego is your enemy and you should let it go and it's all just attachments and i believe that for a while and that served mm -hmm. me in a way that it helped me really understand my emotions and build my self-awareness but at the same time got to a point where it just got into spiritual bypassing and mm. suppressing my emotions, neglecting my inner child, neglecting my needs. And this is a topic that you talk about and so beautifully. And I think you should have like millions and millions of followers because the way you just, mm. I think you explain certain things just like really make sense. And maybe it's going to happen very soon, but like I learned so much from you. And a lot of things that I've experienced and I just get it in my mind, but then you voice it and it's like easier for me to explain to myself and to other people. Right. So just today, I just yeah. want to pick your brain and I'm just really, you know, I have some questions and a lot of things that I, you talk about, I agree with and some things that I kind of have a different perspective. So maybe we can discuss on that and just, just have a conversation. I don't have any, you know, anything prepared, any questions, anything. I just want to follow my curiosity Sounds so great. I want to start maybe with maybe first with a backstory like how we met so I think it's been almost I think eight eight years since we've kind of been in each other's radar so I remember like in 2013 when I did my health coaching business I used to write articles for my body green about health yeah. and weight loss and you are one of the writers as well and I remember I've seen your articles I don't even remember about what, what it was about but just really resonated with me and I reached out to you and I messaged you upon your website or something and I never usually do that but it was just something that you know sparked uh, like curiosity and then we've kind of been yeah. chatting and then when was it like 2018 or 17 I think you, when you were in Bali we actually met in person and we hang out a little bit and that yeah. was my time in life when I was like going through a major major transition I was letting go of a lot of my ego and my identity and because yeah. I was up until that point I was vegan for years and then I yeah. started following my body and like actually my body wants eggs and I want this and then I started rebelling against myself and I remember mm. this one and you, I didn't know, we didn't know each other that well, but to me, like you represented that vegan movement. And as I used to call the vegan police, I don't think you are that now, but at a time. And I remember, I, and also for like five or six years, I had no alcohol. And that one time, me and my friend Gina, we had been tying supermarket and I was just going through this like rebellion stage and I was about to, you know, go through a breakup with my partner. And there was like a lot going on and I had, a block of cheese for the first time in eight years and a bottle of yeah. wine in my hands and yeah. feeling so ashamed and embarrassed. And then oh. I run into you and your husband and your sister. And it was just like this big cosmic joke. And I'm like giggling inside. I'm like, oh my God, the vegan police caught me. So oh, geez. Yeah, no, I never, ever would have judged you for that. 
Yeah, but at the time, because I was judging myself and I was like projecting yeah. it onto others and like, oh my God, this would be like the worst thing if the vegan police sees me. Because at the time, now I just don't give any bucks and like, last year yeah. I ate meat and I just like follow what my body needs and I feel healthier than ever, even though I went through a lot of, you know, emotional roller coaster last year. But yeah, yeah so that was kind of just <laughs> an interesting story. And now, since I've been immersed more into your work and studied like what you teach, I understand like, okay, Ali would have never judged me, but <laughs> just wanted never. to share that fun never. fact. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. And actually, we met before that. Yeah, Our yeah. first connection was actually Young and Raw. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That was where we first connected because you were starting to publish articles on Young and Raw. And I was their holistic nutritionist. Yes, yeah. So we're both. So that was our. I think that was our first. And I yeah. guess you still are. Let me close this because I think the light is over yeah. here. And but yeah, it's just. Um. Yeah, it's an interesting, kind of like that. Now we're gonna talk yeah. about ego and it. Uh, that the reason why I'm bringing it up, I think it's because it's relevant. So, yeah. yeah what do you? think like what is the biggest misconception about ego and why do we see it as an enemy and like I want to get I don't know into conversation and eventually get to the point like how can we actually integrate it in a healthy way yeah okay so the the reason we believe the ego is bad is because we have pain we have pain we don't know how to deal with and in our childhoods the only thing we had control over was our own behavior and our own self. And the only way to get our needs met, the only way to have pleasure and have pain taken away was to be or do something that elicited a response from our caregivers or whoever was responsible for us, people around us, understanding us, meeting our needs, taking our pain away, giving us pleasure, right? So that was our foundation for how we get the things we want and how we get away from the things that we don't want. Mm -hmm. It's my behavior elicits a response from someone outside of me and they either provide me with the thing that I want, they take away the thing that I don't want, and if I am rejected by them, if I am take if I am misunderstood by them, if I'm abandoned by them, this then becomes an existential threat. Mm -hmm. Right? So we need to understand that these parts of ourselves that we judge as our ego, that self sabotage, that cope, that scapegoat, or that we just feel are bad, like we are ashamed of these parts of ourselves. Our sexuality, our personality type, uh, the things that we love, the things that we don't like, but all of these things. Or wanting to be seen or wanting, you know, so you mm -hmm. put a picture on social media and people say like, it's your ego, you want to be seen. Right. I think. Yes, of course. And right, there's going to be healthy aspects of that and there's going to be maybe unhealthy aspects of that. And like we, you can't actually say this is a bad part of you or this is a good part of you. It's every part of you is simply doing what it knows to do to try to keep you alive. So, right? So where this fracturing of the self happens mm -hmm. is when something that is genuine to us or genuine to our growth process gets us abandoned or rejected by our caregivers. That's when that part of ourselves becomes a literal existential threat, right? It is now compromising your capacity to live. Like, not just to be happy, not just to... Because in your childhood mind, you don't have reasoning that mom is still going to love me and still going to feed me, even though she's mad at me right now. Yeah. All you know is, I'm dependent on this person for everything. They just pulled away because of something I did. This part of me is bad. Like, this part of me, it's not even like a belief we have. It's literally you have experienced these parts of yourself existentially mm -hmm. threatening your survival. Mm -hmm. That's where that first core fracture happens, right? And what we have to understand is that each and every single one of us has a genetic blueprint, right? We would never question, 
Like, do you have the hair color you have? Do you have the nose shape that you have? Do you have the body that you have? And that is not something that you can fundamentally alter. We would never question that, right? Like, of course, we can dye our hair, we can do plastic surgery, whatever. But your DNA mm -hmm. wants to express the pattern that you were born with. That, and it, it is like that for all of life. All life wants, the one actual source of pleasure for a living being is self-expression, growth, evolution, being able to express your genetic potential. Now, being that we are quite complex beings, we're not just genetic, physical beings that want to express a physical body. We have personalities, we have likes, dislikes, all of these very complex parts of self that are a part of our DNA, part of our expression, and what feels good to us is to have those parts grow, right? And so what is required for growth? New information, experience, trying things you didn't know before. Yes, all of that is a part of growth. And then expressing these parts of self, allowing them to express, mm -hmm. and then each time we express a part of self, we learn something about it, which actually enables us to, ex to expand on the complexity of that part. Mm -hmm. So that's really what we want. We want to be having experiences that allow for all parts of ourselves to be constantly evolving. Mm. Right? So when we say, like, we want to find our real self, like, and we can't, <laughs> because the real self isn't a static thing. Right? Who and what you are, just like your bot, like your real body. Well, your real bot, it was real when you were five. It was real when you're 95. And they look entirely different. And they are both your body. They are your body that has taken this journey. It's the same with the mental, emotional, spiritual, creative self. It's not that you are a thing that you are going to become. It's that you are we are complex, we are life, so we are constantly evolving, adding to, building upon what is. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that gets shamed, so, that needs to express, because if you need, you know, food, water, shelter, clothes, that's totally normal, that's acceptable. Yeah. But if yeah. you want to dance or be too loud, then you are like in your... And it, it, in childhood, like, just don't be too much. And then when you were grown up, like, oh, you're seeking attention. You want to feel seen, like, yeah. your ego. And yeah. so I want to kind of find, like, get your, you know, kind of definition. How do you differentiate between, like, what's yeah. your ego, what's healthy and unhealthy? And also another thing, like, in Buddhism and in self-development, there's this thing, like, oh, they are your needs and these are your wants. So, and there's this meme going on, you know, like, was like a big book of like, this are my need. This is what I thought they were needs, but actually it's only this. This is all my wants. And yeah. yeah, so, and how do you also distinguish, like, what's your real need coming from your soul or your DNA, whether it's like soul DNA, kind of metaphorical DNA or, your, you know, genetic, you know, like a biological DNA and what is coming from trauma? Because a lot of our yeah. needs and patterns could be just coping mechanisms. So maybe like yeah. when seeking the need is out of control, maybe that's not. So how do we find like that healthy way to bring those needs back? Yeah. And are there some okay. needs that are actually not needs, but are just our wants or the ego? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Okay, so right again, the ego is not a bad thing. The ego, for my purposes, the way that I like to define it is just that unique creature that you are, that is going to be developing. And you either are developing in the light or you're developing in the shadow. You're either, just like every other living being, if you're not getting your needs met, if you're being shamed, if you're being abandoned, if parts of yourself aren't being given the opportunity to grow because we've said, okay, this is a bad part, I have to get rid of it. Like the, the example I always give is the child that hits another child because he wants the toy. And then they never actually learn compassion and sharing because it, the child gets shamed for hitting the other child and then goes into existential crisis mode and maybe just either learns the rules, so don't do that, 
but I don't really know why. Or they will have this aggressive part for the rest of their life because it, it didn't get to mature. Whereas if, if that part was actually nourished and nurtured, what a caregiver would do would say, okay, come here. Now, how does it feel when you look at the other child that you hit? Like, can you just be in your body, be in your emotions? Like, I still love you. I still approve of you. There's no existential threat. How did it feel to hit the other child? Right? You got the toy that you wanted, so that might feel good. But how does it feel to look at the other child crying? And every normal child is going to be like, not, that doesn't feel good. We have natural empathy. Mm-hmm. And then we'd say, okay, now let's practice. How about you get to play with the toy for five minutes, and then they get to play with the toy for five minutes. And let's see how that feels. And then the child would learn sharing feels better. I still get what I wanted. I still get to play with the toy. But I learned why. I learned why sharing is better. So now I'm not arguing with this aggressive part of myself, which is a natural part of human development that needs to be matured. Yes, it's not a bad part. It was just an immature part. So how did we love that part safe so that it could grow? Right? So was it, is it good to hit the other child? Well, overarchingly, it doesn't give us the result we want. It causes harm. Because remember, we're life. Life wants to live. The thing that hurts is when life is being destroyed. The thing that feels good is when life is being supported. Because we are all connected, when we do something to harm another, even if it seemingly serves ourselves in the moment, the fact that it causes destruction outside of us means it will cause destruction inside of us. Right? If we look at like the leaders of our world who have all the money in the world, all the resources, all the whatever, they're like dead inside. They had to sell their humanity to get there. They have all their physical needs met, but they're not thriving because you can't. You cannot be inherently destructive and on a life-generating path and therefore feeling pleasure. It's not possible because the thing that feels good is life being supported. The thing that feels bad is life being destroyed. That is the fundamental nature of the human being. So... When we are being abandoned and abused and neglected and shamed for these real, true parts of self, we start to develop our consensus reality self. We start to fall into the patterns of who we're supposed to be to get love because that love equals provision to us as children. Mm -hmm. And so we start to get rid of these parts of self or we try to abandon these parts of ourselves, we try to get rid of these parts of ourselves, we, we start this dance, the Buddhist dance of trying to get rid of our ego, immediately upon childhood. It's not really even a spiritual teaching. It's absolutely just a childhood coping mechanism. These are the parts of me that get me rejected, therefore they cause pain, I need to get rid of them, and then I will be happy. Mm-hmm. So, so what, that's the child. Yeah. What do you say to these people? Because sometimes people would comment on my posts or would come to my DMs and try to teach me how to live and say like, oh, it's all just in your head. And I get it because I guess I built my audience in a way because I was really following that, like, you know, it's all in your mindset and change your beliefs. And yes, that does work. But then when you're in so much pain, when you go through trauma and like things that happened to me last, yeah, um, I lost both of my parents. It does work. Yeah. And to an extent, because it's also like different levels and it can get you the results. And it's, I still believe that these things like changing your beliefs and Joe Dispenza stuff and like tuning into emotions and having control over that, that does work in the right context when you want to Mm -hmm. manifest something. And I've seen the results and it's not like it's like this complete bullshit. But at the same time, you come to a point where like all your past traumas and wounds are reactivated. Because if someone had really good upbringing and there's not a problem and they just want to take it to the next level, yes, these are the right tools. And that was for a while, but then things that I haven't felt since I was a little baby and it was kind of suppressed, got activated, yeah. you know, last yeah. year. And then it wasn't, I, I could just 
try to practice things in my head and I'm really good at coaching myself. And in my head, I could just get it all. I know the answers and everything, but the body and the yeah. nervous system does something else. And then yeah. people come and tell me like, oh, honey, it's all just in your head. You just need to like, literally, it's not what you're saying, but disassociate, <laughs> like just, it's all in your head, yeah. all these emotions. And even in these, in the fast and the meditation retreats, which I've done 10 of, of them, and one was like 21 days. So it's really intense and you do go into these other realms and it's amazing yeah. experience and all of that. But that's like the, one of the practices is to actually watch your emotions and detach from that and like see your body from the outside. And I also do believe that it is a valid practice and it has helped me understand so much. And when you experience that, okay, like yeah. I detach from pain and pain is no longer unpleasant, it's just a sensation. It taught yeah. me a lot, but again, it comes, there comes a time where you just, it doesn't work. So how do you balance like your nervous system and your body and the emotions yeah. Yeah. with your mind? And yes, I've also been practicing just like last thing, like sitting with your emotions, but at the same time, how do you find that balance between feeling all your emotions and indulging in your emotions on like, where yeah. is that? Yeah. So again, my form of spirituality is very practical. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the reality is, number one, you didn't just start feeling your inner child stuff last year, right? Your interaction with your nine-year partner was 100% your inner child. Well, not necessarily 100%, but like the, the repetitive fights you had, the triggers, all that stuff, that was him bumping up against your, this is how I get love, this is how I get approval, this is what makes me safe. And he would bump up against that, and that's part of where the conflict comes from. Like, we're not tuned into actual reality, because remember what happens in childhood. We learn provision, so me getting my needs met, comes from another, me being a certain way, so that another person will respond to me in a certain way, and that's how I get my needs met. Actually, in that in, situation, can I just elaborate something? Because in that situation, it was slightly different, because I was with my ex-partner, because he was tending to my inner child, and that was really helpful, and that was actually very supportive and harmonious relationship, and we did not fight. We would have discussions, but it was very respectful harmonious and actually because i've grown so much i've come to a point where I'm like okay this is actually now hindering my growth so it wasn't bad i didn't leave because it was bad it was more, more yeah a decision like for my next level of growth i need yeah. to become an adult so i was actually right. so it's not and that's why later when i went into other romantic relationships which were more traumatic or like that's where i think the inner child actually started like being activated yeah. than right. know, that relationship. Right. Yeah, and, and so this is the thing, right? Because this is what adulthood is. True adulthood is when you start to become self-aware enough to understand what your own needs are. So again, pain and pleasure, mm -hmm. right? So when we say something works and something doesn't work, lots of people tell me their diet works because they lost 20 pounds for six months but then they gained 30 pounds back within a year. And they're like, it worked because I lost 20 pounds. And I'm like, but it didn't work mm -hmm. because you gained 30. And they're like, no, 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 it worked. I just need to get back on the diet. And I said, no, no, no. If the diet worked, you would never gain the weight back again because you would have figured something fundamental out about your physiology. And you would have figured things out about your nervous system and figured things out that that would be your new way of life. The result would be permanent. And then you are growing from there. That's what it looks like when something works. Mm -hmm. When we get a foundation of an understanding, a foundation of a result that we then build on. We don't keep going backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards and backwards and having to use discipline to stay on the track and all of these things. That's not something working. So that's why I say when the people tell you it's all in your head, it works because it makes me feel better for five minutes, but then it all comes back again and then I dissociate and then it comes back and then I dissociate and then it comes back. It's not working. 
because you're having the same experience over and over again and you're not making progress. Mm -hmm. Right? So we have to be able to say, if it really worked, you would no longer experience that emotion. You wouldn't have to dissociate anymore because it just wouldn't happen anymore. And there are zero people who are having that experience because emotions are not ego. Emotions are a part of our pain and pleasure sensory organ, organism to help us understand complex life. If we didn't have emotion, it's literally like saying, I don't want to have my, my sense of touch anymore. Because every time I touch a fire, it hurts. So I just wish I could just get rid of my sense of touch. And it's like, no. Because if you didn't have your sense of touch, if you didn't have your sensation of pain, people who don't have pain receptors die much earlier than everyone else because they don't have the feedback mechanism that what they're doing is destroying themselves. So they will continue to do things that are actual self-degradation, not know it because they don't feel it, and then they're destroyed. Mm -hmm. It's so, the exact same thing with emotions. So if you are in pain, does that mean, you know, if that's your internal guidance system, and it means like okay, yes. if you're actually in pain, you're doing something, yes. you're off track, Oh, yes, but I'm just like trying to put it, you know, practically. So let's say, you know, I you want go through life situations where, for example, like I lost my parents, I was betrayed romantically, right? So it's yeah. So then yeah, I'm in pain. So does it mean like I'm viewing it wrong? Because there's also that teaching that you know, like if you're in pain, then you're viewing reality incorrectly. Your perception is wrong. No. Yes. Oh no. <laughs> that is like that is my least favorite teaching ever. Okay. There's nothing inherently perfect about reality. Reality is inherently cause and effect. Reality is inherently structured and it follows a basic program. But there is no rule that says that what is happening is perfect. No, no, no. What is happening makes perfect sense based on the cause and effect relationship of the structure of reality. Mm -hmm. If I shoot you with a gun, the bullet hitting your head is what should happen based on the laws of physics. Yeah. But does that mean it was good? Well, for our purposes, we value life. We value expression. We value life being supported. That's what feels good to us. So me shooting you in the head is antithetical to that. Okay. So there's also the pain of experience. There, again, I am not so spiritual as to say we're supposed to be blissed out when our parents pass away. That's not reasonable. It's sad. There are things in life that are tragic. There are things in life that are painful. We really want to believe that everything is just perfect and everything's working out perfect. And again, that's the inner child who's afraid to admit that we live in a planet of chaos, which we do. There is chaos. Yes, we have some control. Yes, we can manifest and create and understand things and create technologies that make things better, which we have been doing for all of human history. And there will always be things we have no control over. There's a tornado because there was a gust of wind, that, a weather pattern, that it, it's just how Earth works. But didn't you manifest that? Because <laughs> that's also that belief, like, no. that, you know, if you got into that space where this was happening, so somehow you have, must have No, this. that's victim blaming, right? So like every person who was born into a third world com country manifested that. No. This is, they were born there, and it was a result of humans reproducing forever and ever and ever, and then creating shitty systems. That's why that happened. So yes, 
there's nothing wrong with the mindset of I'm going to take everything that happens to me as an opportunity to learn whatever I can learn from it. Yeah. That's a fantastic way to live. That's how I live too. But it's showing me the patterns of reality. So there are some patterns of reality I can't do anything about. There are some patterns of reality I can do things about. So like the prayer in the Bible. Help me to accept the things I cannot change and give me the courage to change the things that I can't. That is really what awakening is. You become more and more and more aware of how the structure functions, right? And then you'll no longer see it as manifesting. You'll see that you consciously created something. You consciously set yourself down a path. And that was plausible for you and possible for you because of everything that happened before you were born. Right? Like, I'm never going to manifest being a six foot four basketball player, no matter how much I do the manifesting work. It's not possible. That's not how physics works. I can try and manifest it all I want. I can do all the manifesting. It's never going to happen. Because there are limits. So, there are definitely things that to us seem miraculous. And it's just because we didn't understand the system. Right? The, what they say is that everything is magic until it's understood and then it becomes a technology. Yeah. Whatever is happening to you is a cause and effect result of your behavior and everyone around you's behavior and all of human history up until right now. And the structure of reality and how it works. And the decisions other people are making. And the decisions you're making. And all of these things. Again, I know that inner child wants to believe I'm manifesting it because we don't want to believe that there's chaos. Because that's scary. That's scary to the inner child. But an adult says, I'm going to control what I can control. I'm going to learn from every single one of my chaotic experiences because it does give me insight into what I didn't know before and gives me a little bit more empowerment for the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. But ultimately, if a lightning decides to strike me right now, I didn't manifest that. I was here and lightning struck because lightning strikes. Hmm. Right? If, I, if it's a lightning storm and I go outside to the top of the highest hill with a, with a metal rod and I get hit by lightning, I, I manifested that. <laughs> right? I, cr- I made a whole bunch of decisions based on what I understand about how weather works, that it was pretty likely I was going to get hit by lightning. Even though getting hit by lightning is rare, we know some things that can give us a little bit of a better chance of getting hit by lightning. Yeah. So when we're manifesting, it's really that. It's we're, we're honing our attention onto the patterns of reality that would enable that outcome. And if it's possible for us, and if the rest of kind of reality agrees to it, we can probably make it happen. Yeah. But if it's not something that happens within the realm of reality, it's not going to happen. Because we don't just magically manifest. Yeah. We consciously create as much as we can. Yeah, I always say, like, you can manifest absolutely anything. As long as it's in alignment with your mind, body, and soul structure. So, like, if your soul has different agenda, you can call it, like, your divine aspect, whatever that is. And if your body, which means your biology, and then your mind, which means, like, your beliefs are in alignment, then, like, you can have anything. But as you said, like, your body is not in alignment with six foot five, you know, basketball player. But I also want to, what's it, a subtle shift in energy with it, I feel. Yeah. And, um... Another thing I want to just come back to pain and emotion. So I was talking to my friend who's kind of like a mentor to me and he's like really well read and knows so much. And I was sharing about my experiences, but that was in November last year before even like really bad events happened. And I said like, I've been doing so much healing and all these things are like happening. So when I'm going to be done. And he said something like, Osha, like if you've done so much, healing and you've healed your own wounds on your own own stuff and you're so aware 
But if you continue being in that frequency of healing and you feel open, it's like endless things that you can heal in the collective and you're picking up anxiety. Because like up until last year, I would never felt anxiety. Not never, but like it was never an issue unless it's like situation in life. I'm not a very anxious person. And then I was feeling a lot of anxiety and I felt like, is that mine? Like it's nothing happening in my life. And maybe I was anticipating, maybe my, I knew that like, what's coming. I don't know, but I was just, and he said, yeah, like, if you're open for healing and you are so like empathetic and open, it's like endless things that you can heal in the collective or past lives, these lives. And mm. then, I, and he said, like, just immerse yourself into work and focus on something that you love doing. So what's your, cause I believe maybe there is some truth in that, but how do you reconcile these two things like healing and when are you done and like or at least because i've also seen like especially living in bali and these like spiritual communities and woke people like they go into the healing journey and then they get i think then you do get some like ego attachments to like i'm someone who is healing and you're just continuously going to like shamans and looking for what's wrong with you and yeah and like how, cause it's like too extreme. So how do you reconcile? Like when do you? Well, yeah. yeah. It's to say if your healing work is just going on and on and on and on and on, it's not working. Again, you're not healing. You think you're healing. You're having a lot of nervous system experiences, right? You can do all the fucking plant medicine you want. <laughs> you can have all the astral projections and all the sessions and blah, 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 blah. But if it isn't changing your fundamental view of yourself, and your fundamental view of your reality so that you can behave differently. Because again, why are you doing your healing work? Because you're in pain. Why are you in pain? Because you're doing things that are against life. You're experiencing things in a way that isn't true to how reality functions. So again, right, like, first things first, the whole, like, if your body is sick, you're going to feel pain. If your body is actually healing, you will have less pain without having to do all the things to make the pain less. Right? Are we cleaning up the mess or are we coping? And a lot of people are just coping with their emotions. They're calling it healing, but it's not. So what's the and difference? And so the difference is that exactly the same way that when you 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 are hurting your hand, right, because your hand is on a burner. And you're in pain, and you're in pain, and you're in pain, and you're in pain, and you're doing all this stuff, and you're trying to take painkillers, and you're trying to cut your hand off, and you're doing all this shit. And then finally you realize, okay, wait, my hand is on a surface. That surface is hot. Okay, heat destroys tissue. Maybe my hand hurts because it's on a burner and it's being destroyed. What happens if I take my hand off? Whoa, I never considered that before because everyone I know lives with their hand on a burner. That was how I was raised. That was how we all did it. And now I have to heal this hand, right? There's, a, there's that period of catharsis where the tissue regenerates and it's all pussy and gross and you have to put whatever, whatever. But you will no longer have the same pain, the repetitive pain of having your hand on the burner when the, burn, when the hand is actually healing. Mm -hmm. You're going you're gonna to start to see why that pain was happening. Mm -hmm. So in the real You're going to start to understand the patterns, the actual patterns of like what was actually out of alignment there. And then you go through a phase of not knowing what else to do. Mm -hmm. You have to go through the dark night of the soul the wandering through the wilderness, the I have no idea what reality is if my whole reality just crumbled in front of me. And we continue on with that until eventually we start to put the puzzle pieces together. And we start to be able to live in a new way where we're not repeating our, ourselves. We're not taking the same actions. We're not choosing the same partners. We're not choosing the same jobs. We don't have that problem we always used to have over and over and over again because we understood why we had it. We understood what we were doing to continue that pattern. And we understood how to make a different pattern. Mm -hmm. And if we don't understand that, we're not healing. We're just 
activating our nervous systems. Because remember, right before you die, you go numb or you go bliss. When we do a lot of these spiritual things, like plant medicines and all of these um, like really intense breath work sessions and, and these really intensive vipassanas and all of this stuff, mostly what we're doing is we're putting ourselves into a state of fight or flight. So we feel that intense fear, that intense rejection, that intense, oh my God, I'm going to die. And then it relaxes into that bliss of like, oh my God, I see the universe and blah, 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 blah. Most of the time, that's just your body compensating for thinking you're literally at the end of your life. So it releases that flood of hormones and endorphins so that you don't feel the final blow. And that's what most people are saying is their spirituality. And that's why we just do the same thing over and over and over again. We have all these experiences. We have all these insights, blah, 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 blah. And then we just go and do the same stuff over and over and over. Because we didn't get anything. We didn't really get it. So what we actually want to do with our emotions is absolutely we do want to learn to observe them. Because most of us are so assuming we understand what our emotions mean and we're acting on them in a repetitive way over and over and over again, thinking we're going to get different results from doing the same thing. So the, the process of learning to witness your emotion is really just the process of don't act on it right now. Because right now in your nervous system, you're just going to want to do the same reaction over and over and over again. You want to go to the medicine ceremony. You want to do yoga. You want to whatever, whatever. You want to have the fight. You want to leave the relationship. You want to be with the guy. You want to drink. You want to cope. You want to self-sabotage. We want it. And it's, so it's the same thing with the how do we figure out what we really need. It's the exact same process. You make the emotion or you make the desire for whatever you want safe. I'm just going to feel it for five minutes. I'm going to witness that I want the thing that I want. And I'm not going to tell myself I'm bad. I'm not going to tell myself I can't have it. In fact, I'm going to tell myself that I can have it. Because when I tell myself I can't have it, what do I do? I stimulate my nervous system that I'm going to die. Because your coping mechanisms, your self-sabotage, your addictions, your, the ways that you hurt and you harm yourself are how your nervous system thinks you survive. That is why you do it. Why does the nervous system do that? Because that's what you learned in your childhood. Right? So literally in your childhood, the loud part of you that got rejected, now you don't even recognize when you have the need to express loud, you won't even notice that. You're not even going to come online until you're 40 episodes deep into a Netflix series. You don't even recognize. The reason you do the Netflix is so that you won't express the loud because expressing the loud got you rejected and that's death. So Netflix just saved your life. Hmm. This is what we need to start to understand. Why am I with this dude again? Because he mirrors the patterns of how you know how to be in a relationship. Hmm. He expresses the same kind of patterns of give and take that your caregivers did. You know how to operate with this person. I really want to dive into that and ask you some questions. But before that, just one thing I'll share, like how I've kind of learned to deal with my emotions and maybe you have some extra tips. So like even this morning, I had really bad dreams last night. I yeah. was like kind of relived some of the experience, but in the worst way, like I felt betrayed and I woke up feeling like oh, a little bit like, man, just feeling like really betrayed and tender and sad. So I just sat yeah. with my inner child and I journal. Sometimes I journal and I would like take on a, you know, part like inner child, like what do you have to tell me? And I was just like, I'm yeah. really sad, lonely, and please don't leave me. And I was yes, just sad exactly. and like, I see you. It's okay. Yeah. I'm not going to try to like fix you. Like, what do you need to do? And exactly. I just sat with it like for a while. And I was like, well, I need to get up and prepare for yeah. the slide. Like the inner child needs another minute. So yeah. I did that. And then next, and when I sit with it, and then I just ask, like, okay, what do you need now? And then, like, I want to yes. do power now. And they're like, okay, let's go, honey. So that's kind of been that's my... That's exactly point. it. 
That's exactly it, right? So we, in my work, I call it the displaced desire. It's the, the thing you do that causes you pleasure in the moment or numbing or self-sabotage or whatever in the moment, but pain long-term, we know that that's a consensus reality. That's a I'm trying not to be a part of myself or I'm getting a need met in the only way I know how. This is meeting a need in some way that I am not even aware that I have this need, usually. Mm -hmm. So this is why we create that space to just witness what comes up when I feel the anxiety and just don't act on it. I just want to feel, I just want to feel it. And you got to think of it like you don't get nutrition from chewing food in your mouth. You get nutrition because it processes its way all the way through your digestive system and into your body. Emotions are the same way, right? When we're feeling it, we're processing it. The information is being deconstructed and reconstructed. And the, the better you get at this feeling process, the more information you get from your emotions. Yeah. Your emotions will start to say, I am hurting because I believe this, which causes me to do this, which causes me to act in this way, which is against life. That's how you know you're healing. Yeah. You start to understand your emotions are saying, I keep living this way, and it's against life. Mm -hmm. That's why. Okay? And same with our desires. Same with the thing we think are needs. The way we figure out what a real need is, is that we have to approach it with complete non-judgment. We say, I'm going to witness myself doing this thing. And I'm going to say, what is the result? What am I getting from it? What is the positive intention behind this? So, again, what, either what is it giving me or what is it helping me not be or do? Mm -hmm. That's how we start to differentiate. Is it a real need or is it a consensus reality need? And it takes time. It's a lot of self-reflection. It's a lot of really just being on your own side, and assuming everything you do has a positive intention. Every single thing you do has a positive intention. It's just that your pain and pleasure mechanisms got, your wires got crossed in your childhood. Because what got you accepted was actually against your true biology, but in the short term, that was the best thing for your growth. Because yep. your parents' acceptance of you was more important than you expressing as a loud person. In your adulthood, you expressing as a loud person is more important for your growth than your parents accepting you. Yeah, that's why I do crazy things, like even in breathwork sessions, or like I just, not scream, I just do like weird noises and body practices, and now just my yes. probably think I'm crazy, but I just don't care, but yeah. it feels really good. I like singing, and I don't have a good singing voice, but I just like sing the mind yeah. person just self out. And what else I was going to say? Yeah. And, oh, another thing that like, people always know in self-development, say like the outside world is in the reflection of your internal world and how you treat yourself. This is how other people will treat you. And this is, and I believe that is true, but at the same, like maybe not complete truth, but for example, in terms yeah. of like my, one of my biggest wounds or probably my biggest wound was abandonment. And not necessarily awesome. like just rejection for who I am, but just because of life circumstances. And this is my wound and this is what I've been working on throughout the years. And I feel like I'm the person that I know like works on this the most. And I'm even like when I feel something, I will sit with my inner child and I'm really not abandoning myself to the best of my ability. And then mm -hmm. I still somehow manage to attract the circumstances. So like, that's why I start, I don't know, questioning myself. Is it just divine timing? And do I just need to practice it more? Or am I doing something no wrong so why do i still attract like why do i fall in love with men who seem to put me on a pedestal in the beginning and that's just like the same childhood story being played out like parents really love me but they couldn't be with me so they're like someone really loves me but can't actually meet the needs that i want in a relationship and then i feel yeah. abandoned and like okay. i just fucking want to get out of the cycle you're not attracting it you are attracted to it mm -hmm. It's not coming to you. 
you are picking it. But it feels because... like because I never actually go for it. So somehow I just do my thing and someone sees me and thinks like I want this person and you know sure. so it feels like I'm doing I'm being passive until I'm not, until they get me in that moment, like it just And that passivity is part of the program. Right? You hanging back and waiting for someone to adore you is part of the pattern. Right? It starts before it even starts. Mm -hmm. This is what I'm trying to say. The guys who would come and not abandon you are not even on your radar. You have you are not you are not what would be attractive to them because of the way that you carry yourself. And they are not what would be attractive to you because to your nervous systems, you guys don't know how to get love from each other. Mm -hmm. You don't know that pattern. Your nervous system only knows how to do the abandonment relationship. But not because really, because for 10 years, I was in a relationship that was everything opposite of abandonment. So I actually, yeah. I have that experience. And it's not like I'm always, yeah. so it's like just the last two and a half years that I've been experiencing this. Yeah. Yeah. So again, right, like what you had with your partner before, it could be that you were not like romantically sparked. Yeah. By that. Right? It was it was a friendship. Yeah. Because again, it didn't really get at what what is love to you yeah does that make sense yeah absolutely yeah that's right exactly like right. it was a platonic way of being yeah but and and also if your wound is the abandonment wound you would have chosen someone who was never going to get that close to you right like you were you were best friends and you were intimate in that way but he didn't like have you. Yeah. Right? He couldn't abandon you. Because the wall, there was a wall. There the 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 true like I am Osha here is like all of me, right? You were being your consensus reality self with him. A lot. And it wasn't even something you were doing on purpose. That was who you knew to be. So his consensus reality self was meeting with your consensus reality self, and you were playing out the roles. But it wasn't you and him what was under that. Mm -hmm. So now you're starting to show up as, like, the non-consensus reality part of yourself that isn't all put together, that isn't mature in a lot of ways, that has this programming, and that's what you are attracted to. That is the pattern of relating that you do. You wait for the guy. You wait. You're cool. You're pulled back. Right? Like, it, it's, like I say, it's starting even before it starts. And you're not attracted to the guy that would be the stable because then what would you do? Because if he doesn't abandon you, how do you relate to that? You don't know how to relate to that. That like the high won't be there. The high of being chosen won't be there. The high of being love bombed won't be there. He'll just be a normal dude who thinks you're great. And then right there's not and and then you have to actually show up. And like do the hard work of a relationship. And that would actually be like way harder and scarier for someone who is so used to being abandoned, right? The actual prospect of someone who isn't going to abandon you is going to be far scarier than the person who is. Because you know how to do getting abandoned. You know how to clean up that mess, and then you can put up that wall, and you're good. The dude that doesn't leave, and then you have to be a level of vulnerable with him that you've never been with any other human being ever that's going to feel like death to your nervous system there's no way you're going to choose that
So a few questions, but I have yeah. chosen that because I kind of got into that understanding and I thought, okay, I need to practice it. So with the last person, that's why like it kind of, you know, like, I just practice like my whole vulnerability with like risking that I'm going to seem like as a crazy as fucking person on this planet and just like really, you know, just like showing my whole like vulnerability and everything. And I, I knew like how it's going to go. And I was like, okay with that, but I need to practice. I need to show up and I need to show myself that I'm not going to die. I almost felt I was, I was going to die, but I didn't. Yeah. So that was yeah. kind of the only thing that I knew, like, how do I, cause I get it. And I've done like a lot of deep inner work, like on this. So I, what you're saying, like totally resonates. So how do I get at, and it's not, cause I try to convince myself and like meet someone, but you know, when you just like romantically not interested, like you can't make yourself be that. Just yeah. how emotions are natural, like your needs are just yeah. there. We don't choose our emotions yeah. or our needs. We can only set the conditions yeah. for them. So same yeah. with like romantic partners. So I can't make myself be attracted to this guy that I'm not. And for some reason, I'm always just like these like super charismatic and spiritual yeah. and deep guys that we can have like godly conversations and amazing like sexual yeah. attraction but it actually doesn't lead yeah. to anything yeah. so you are so, right like it gives me the high and then get yeah. addictive yeah so this is this is what you're gonna have to do for your inner child is you're gonna have to keep showing up for yourself you have to stop abandoning you like the work that you're doing right now is the reprogramming work is the you learning how to not abandon yourself and that dramatic relationship no longer being the one you have with yourself. Yeah. And the more you become comfortable with that and your nervous system learns that you can get your needs met through just being seen and being vulnerable. Yeah. What you are going to be attracted to will change on its own. You won't have to force yourself to be attracted to something different. You just will be just like, you were attracted to living in Asia until you changed so much, you're not attracted to that anymore. Yeah. That's what happens. When we mature, the things we're literally attracted to will change. Yeah. You won't like, have to try. Countries or yeah. partners. Okay, so I am yeah. on the right track, hopefully. <laughs> yes, 100%. But at the same time, by doing this work and showing up for my inner child and just being really like present it brings up the old heartache, like all the old heartbreak. Yeah. So like someone who betrayed me three years ago or like two years ago, whatever, and like really lied to me and like in a romantic connection and that ended. And I was just like really compassionate, like, oh, he must be in such a hard place because he was put in a situation where he felt he could, you know, he needed to lie and I was like super compassionate and like coaching, but like said goodbyes, but you know, and, but that was like, he lied about like something horrible like he was actually yeah. in another relationship. He was married and had kids in another country and lied to me. Yeah. So that yeah. was kind of, but then I was like, oh, poor him. And I like suppressed yeah. it kind of, I still like cried and did my thing and moved on. And now he mess, found a way to message me through one of the channels. And I just got so angry, which I never was before. And I was just No, like, that's good. Good. Fuck you, motherfucker. Like, how yes. dare you to even like message me? Yes. Okay, because this is what people don't understand about the vibrational scale. Yeah. The vibrational scale is the series of emotions you have to go through in order to integrate something. Yeah. There is no fucking skipping steps. Mm -hmm. And if I could just change one thing about the spiritual world, it would be this. Your anger is so important. You have to move through anger. You have to move through despair. You have to move through neutral. In order to get to a place where you fully understand what happened, you've yeah. integrated it. Again, like the child who hit the child and learned how to share through feeling. This is exactly how you're going to learn a new behavior with relationships. Mm -hmm. You have to let yourself be destroyed by it. And then you're going to feel anger. And that's going to teach you something. And then you're going to feel sadness. And that's going to teach you something. And then you're going to feel indifferent. And that's going to teach you something. And each emotional phase is going to be a new vantage point that gives you more and more information that evolves 
and matures the part of you that right now is stuck at childhood. Because that's what's happening. The part of you that keeps being attracted to these men is stuck in childhood. Mm -hmm. You never learned real love. Because you won't let yourself get mad at these guys. You keep trying to skip to, oh, I know why that happened. And you don't. Yeah. Otherwise, you would no longer do that. And I was really proud of being so wise and spiritual. Yes. I don't have to feel angry when people would say, like, think, you know, like, I used to kind of judge, not even consciously, but people who would be angry, like, I'm way past that. I can handle my emotions. I don't have to feel the anger. I can just see, feel compassion and love for everyone. And now yeah. I'm coming to realize that there's probably, I was like thinking about it yesterday, there's like three stages. First, when you have like your emotions and you react and you have no control over it. And then yeah. you come to a point where you become aware and you're like, shit, I'm reacting so yeah. much. And then you learn to control it. And for me, it was for years when I would just like, control it would be super zen and not never like shout or like shout yeah. at anyone like yell yeah and now i've come to a point like okay now i recognize my emotions but i can choose them and now there's a different rant like yeah you fucking motherfucker not at him even like not to yeah him, but like to my you know not at myself but just no yes at the situation there's a difference between observing your emotions and trying to dissociate from your emotions yeah. that's the thing dissociating from your emotions and then just choosing some higher thought thing in your head that you don't feel in your body. Yeah. Does nothing. That's a big thing. Feeling your emotions. Feeling. Higher feeling. Do you dispense? Oh yeah, no. Patient. Garbage. It, you will get there naturally. You will get there naturally. But you have to let yourself be mad. You have to let yourself have that rant in your head about everything you hate about him. Right? You don't go out and like you said, you don't text him. You don't tell him. You process. You feel. You tell your girlfriends. You cry. You journal. You have a therapist. You feel the anger. You process what happened and why it was so painful. Yeah. And the process will carry you forward. You will eventually get to a place where you don't feel that way about him anymore. You understand what happened. And you are changed because of that circumstance. Yeah. Instead of just trying to bypass it and then repeating it over and over and over again, because that's what your nervous system knows. Hmm. And I've been in that anger stage for the last two, three weeks where I'm just like, you fucking motherfuckers, like, how dare you? Good. Like 15 years ago, you know, I'm just like, yes, oh, it's coming up. And then I'm also be, like watching myself and being aware, like not to get lost in it and not to just attach to that emotion too much yeah. or like just don't not get stuck with it and yesterday i was thinking like okay like is that time to move on do i need to choose a higher thought like how do you I can't get, get stuck, stuck in you can't get stuck in you cannot get stuck in emotion if you're truly truly showing up for it okay good the good. only way an emotion gets stuck is when you're trying to get rid of it period end of story okay yeah good. it stays for as long as it stays because it's not digested yet you got to think of it like, right? I ate an apple two hours ago and I haven't pooped it yet. Is it in there too long? No. Yeah. Just trust your digestive system. The only way it gets stuck is if you constrict. Mm -hmm. You got to trust that you're angry for as long as you're angry. And if you keep having compassion for yourself, you don't get stuck in it. And you will be angry longer than you think you should be. Okay. You will be sad longer than you think you should be. You will be hopeless longer than you think you should be. But so long as the emotion is still there, it still has something to teach you. Mm -hmm. When you're truly done with it, you learn something, you move on to the next phase. So when people say the they're emotion. wallowing, or like someone's wallowing in their emotions. So, so that's a different thing. That's a, that, that can be a, this is how I know how to get love. When I'm sad, when I'm down, that's the only way I know how to be loved by somebody. That is not your circumstance, right? You don't have a habit of being angry your entire life. And every First time you feel... <laughs> yes, exactly. So you see, yeah. you don't have a habit of every time you feel alone, every time you feel neglected, every time you feel scared, every time you feel something you don't know how to control, you burst out in anger. 
And that's kind of like you crying as a baby. Mm-hmm. That's how you know you're not wallowing in it. If it's something, if, if you're in an emotional state and you seem to constantly be in these circumstances that elicit this emotional response, that's just how you know how to get attention. That's how you know how to get love. That's a different thing. You're not wallowing in your emotion. It's you don't know how to ask for someone to just talk to you. You don't know how to express a part of yourself. This is just what you do when you're looking for someone to make the pain go away. You're not aware of your pain. You don't know why you're doing it. You don't know how to fix it. That's why you're doing that. It's like a baby crying. You're just throwing a tantrum and hoping that mom and dad will come and fix it. That's not what's happening with you. Yeah. Right? Wallowing, we we don't wallow. It's either this is a behavior pattern, because this is how I get love, or this is how I have to process this, and it'll be done when it's done. Yeah. And, you know, there's this Joe Dispenza saying that, like, these emotions that you feel, that becomes your personality and becomes... Permanence. So I guess at some point I really was immersed into his work and that has conditioned me. So now I'm like questioning, like, I just want to make sure I don't become an angry lady. But honestly, I don't think I ever will be. It's too no. much love. Even like after like 15 minutes of anger, I'm just like, I'm back to love. But then exactly. Like, like, yeah, exactly. And that's exactly that's exactly the process. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you yeah. so much. So much wisdom and so many so much food for thought. I'm going to think I'm going to yeah. journal and just sit with that and just kind of keep talking to my inner child. So any yes. final thoughts, first of all, where people can find you and you have their mystery school. So if someone wants to dive deep into this work, check it yes. out. Definitely. I think they can find it in your bio, right? But any, any yes. other final thoughts where people can find you, how they can work with you? Yeah, sure. So just the final thought is there's absolutely no bad part of you. There are the parts of you that are existential crises. There are the parts of you that are immature. There are the parts of you that don't know what you need or how to meet those needs. And that's all that's happening. There is no bad ego. And there is chaos in life. And it's not your fault. We do what we can. We have to be pragmatic and adults and just say we control what we can control. What we can't control. We nourish and love in ourselves and we just we get through it. Yeah, That's reality. Okay. Um, so yeah, you can find me on Instagram, Patreon, um, so Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, um, just Aaliyah Perception Trainers. If you type in Perception Trainers YouTube, I'll come up. You have like um, hours and, and hours yet, and hours, like hundreds of videos. So yes, yes I have a lot of videos <laughs> and then I have even more in my mystery school. Yeah. Um, if you want to learn how to do this like emotional processing work that's basically what the mystery school is um and that's basically it yeah well thank you you're so wise and so tapped in and it's always a pleasure chatting with you and i can see a lot of comments like mind-blowing would love to hear more definitely check her out and people say medicine for the soul so cool yeah yeah lots of lots of comments and thank you so much for watching thank you ali for the wisdom and Thank you for let's being do it here. again sometime because I'm sure All right. it's almost it became like a life coaching because usually I coach people but this was the other sitting on the other side so that was really fun yeah, yeah. So thank every you, coach everybody. needs a coach <laughs> exactly thank you everybody yeah. and see you next time thank you for having me bye bye